Rise and shine, loyal theorists. Rise and shine. Not that I wish to imply you have been sleeping on the job watching your videos on fidget spinners and Jake Paul. Well, let's just say your hour has come again. So wake up, theorists. Wake up and smell the ashes. Internet, welcome to Game Theory, the show where I inadvertently piss off fandoms of games that I am genuinely a fan of, slowly alienating me as a gamer franchise by franchise. All except Mario games for some reason. Apparently I can say whatever I want about him. Anyway, the sector of the internet I'm hoping not to enrage today is the Half-Life community, as I try to solve what may be one of the longest standing mysteries in all of gaming. Who is the G-Man? I do apologize for what must seem to you an arbitrary imposition. I trust it will all make sense to you in the course of... Well, I'm really not at liberty to say. I am though, G-Man. It's about 15 minutes. About 15 minutes. Now, since people born on the day the original Half-Life came out turned 18 last year, it's likely that many of you have only been exposed to this masterpiece of a franchise through Half-Life 3 confirmed memes. So let me quickly catch you up on the series and why this guy is so endlessly fascinating and has kept gamers scratching their heads for decades. Half-Life puts you into the shoes of Gordon Freeman, MIT grad with the most absurd doctoral thesis title imaginable. <gasps> Observation of Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen entanglement on supraquantum structures by induction through nonlinear transuranic crystal of extremely long wavelength ELW pulse from mode locked source array. Yes! First time! One and done, baby! Yeah, for a guy who doesn't talk for the entirety of the series, he's awfully wordy. Anyway, Gordon starts a new job at the Black Mesa Research Facility and experiences the worst first day ever, when the team accidentally opens up a gateway that lets in hordes of murderous aliens. Looks like somebody's got a bad case of the Mondays. You as Gordon have to go to the aliens' dimension, known as Zen, in order to shut down whatever's keeping these portals open. After crowbarring your way through hundreds of enemies and killing off a literal testicle monster, you eventually find yourself face to face with the big bad. Zen's leader, the Neolinth, a giant three-armed floating fetus monster that's holding open the portal. You do what you were trained to do in graduate school when first encountering intelligent extraterrestrial life. Shoot it till it dies! As the battle wraps up, you black out, but when you come to, you're face to face with this guy. We never hear his name spoken aloud, but resourceful gamers found him referenced as the G-Man in the game's code, a name later confirmed by Valve. He explains that he and his mysterious employers are now in control of Zen, and he commends you with everything that you've done. The border world, Zen, is in our control for the time being, thanks to you. Quite a nasty piece of work you managed over there. I am impressed. The game ends with him offering you a new job, working for him and his employers. Accept the offer and he puts you into stasis until he needs you again. That's why I'm here, Mr. Freeman. I have recommended your services to my employers. And they have authorized me to offer you a job. Refuse, and he teleports you to a room filled with aliens from Zen to be beaten to death. But here's the craziest thing. Even though this is the first time that he talks to you in the game, if you've been paying attention, he's been watching you silently from the corners the whole time, from out of reach locations. And it was here that the mystery of the G-Man was born. Gamers had years, YEARS to contemplate who this character was, and when Half-Life 2 featured him playing an even bigger role, the questions just began to mount. Who are his employers? How can you explain his odd voice and weird powers? Why is his character model so much uglier than everybody else's? And today, after looking at all the evidence, all the expansion packs, all the hidden lore, the conclusion I've reached will blow your minds. Are you ready for this? After decades of waiting, I've discovered 
discovered that the G-Man is Sans. Wait, 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 don't hit that dislike button. Obviously, I'm just kidding, obviously. But the reason I bring it up other than to poke fun at that theory is that it's worth noting that the G-Man possesses Sans-like powers. He seems to have the ability to teleport since he can disappear without notice. You'll also often see him moving in one direction, but then he'll appear ahead of you somehow. He has telekinetic powers, and we can even see during the ending of Half-Life 2 that he can stop time. Time, Dr. Freeman? Is it really that time again? He appears and disappears across miles in seconds, and between the first game and the second places Gordon Freeman in stasis outside of time. The G-Man plays with the laws of space and time like a fiddle, and this is important since it gives us our first clue as to who this guy actually is. Half-Life 2 opens 20 years after the events of Half-Life 1 with a creepy monologue from the G-Man to Gordon implying that it's time for you to make good on your employment. In the 20 years since you've been put in stasis, a whole nother alien civilization has invaded Earth, this time known as the Combine. The Combine is hardcore. According to the in-game lore, they ground every military on Earth to dust in just seven hours. And we come to learn that the Neolinth and his warriors from Half-Life 1 had been kicked out of their home planet and were hiding on Zen from these guys. So considering that the G-Man explicitly states that he and his employers are in control of Zen at the end of Half-Life 1, that must mean that he's a representative of the Combine then, right? No. The Combine is awesome, and a military force that can't be reckoned with, but they're bad at one thing. Teleportation. Well, teleportation and apparently stopping a science nerd carrying a crowbar, but whatever. It's a major plot point in Half-Life 2 that the Combine, while powerful, can't teleport within a dimension. Sure, they can teleport between dimensions, but once they're in a local space, they have to get around using normal means. Trains, cars, jets, and spaceships. But as we've seen, the G-Man has no problems. Doctor Whoing it up. Additionally, in Half-Life 2, any NPCs that are allied to the rebellion against the Combine will not attack the G-Man, while those who are pro-Combine will. Mm. So the G-Man is the enemy of the Combine, right? Well, it's not so clear-cut. In the DLC... <laughs> Sorry, I mean expansion pack. DLC didn't exist back then. In the expansion pack, Half-Life Opposing Force, the G-Man is seen rearming a nuclear bomb that eventually destroys Black Mesa. The same nuclear bomb that your character had just deactivated. And if that wasn't strange enough, it's this explosion that catches the attention of the Combine in the first place, who then target Earth for their next invasion. So the G-Man is an enemy of the Combine who just so happens to be the person who calls them to Earth Earth in the first place, and this points to another key feature of this character, his role as chess master. The G-Man is about making small moves that have disastrous long-term effects. We learn in Half-Life 2 Episode 2 that he gave the crystal to Black Mesa, which caused all the events in the first game to happen. He drops a nuke at the exact moment that causes a hostile alien invasion. Instead of waking Gordon Freeman up when the Combine first attacks, he instead waits 20 years for the precise moment when Gordon's return would perfectly galvanize humanity to create a successful armed uprising that eventually destroys the Combine's local presence. So, in total, to find the G-Man, we need to find something that can teleport, manipulate time, possesses deep knowledge of how future events fit together, and is an enemy to the Combine. And when you look at all of these traits, they perfectly describe... A Neolinth, a creature that's the same species as the final boss from the first game. Yes, it's my theory that the G-Man, one of the most mysterious characters in the history of gaming, is a creature related to the space fetus from the first game. Let's run down the list. As we covered earlier, all the creatures on Zen and Half-Life were running in fear from the Combine after that species took over their home planet. So they all have the motivation of revenge, and since they can't beat the Combine themselves, setting up an elaborate plan where human resistance fighters will take the Combine down is a good alternate strategy. Just like the G-Man, the Neolinth shows that he also has the power to create and manipulate local teleportation portals, as we see during the final battle against him. We also know that all creatures from Zen can manipulate time and space. The Vortigaunts, a peaceful alien species enslaved by the Neolinth in Half-Life 1, are shown to have the same powers as the Neolinth species, just weaker versions of those powers, teleporting, manipulating space, even existing outside of time. In Half-Life 2, there's an incredibly well-hidden cave that houses what's known as the Singing Vortigaunt. This guy is like Exposition Dump Central, but one interesting thing he says is this. We remember the free man. We are coterminous. There is no distance between us. 
No false veils of time or space may intervene. We see you still in Black Mesa. Clearly we see you in the Nailance Chamber. The word coterminous means existing at the same time. So this proves that the Zen creatures are able to exist beyond the constraints of time. Just like how the G-Man knows which actions to take to set in motion the Combine Takeover, as well as how he's able to set Gordon Freeman outside of time for 20 years. It's also worth noting that when the Vortigaunts unite their powers, they're able to stop the G-Man's plans, preventing him from contacting you and actually teleporting you away from his command at the beginning of Half-Life 2 Episode 1. We'll see about that. This is an essential detail because the Vortigaunts have been enslaved by Neolinths in the past, so of course they would be opposed to whatever plans the G-Man has. But perhaps the most damning of all is that, like I said earlier, when you refuse to work with him at the end of Half-Life 1, the G-Man teleports you to a room filled with aliens you spent the game killing, which is the exact same thing the Neolinth does to you throughout the final boss battle against him. Now I'm sure some of you must be confused. How can I say that this thing, the thing that you kill at the end of the first game, is the same as the G-Man. We literally see this creature die. Well, it's easy, actually. There's canonically more than one Neolith. Although the game acknowledges that this Neolith, the final boss of Half-Life 1, this species has been hunted to near extinction, according to a little-known interview with Mark Laidlaw, lead writer for the story of Half-Life, there have been others. When asked whether the Vortigaunts or Neolith had ever been captured by the Combine prior to Half-Life 2, Mark replied that, quote, that particular Neolith was the last of its kind and never captured, but some of its predecessors Predecessors might have been, end quote. So we know that there are precursors to the Neolith species out there, but it gets deeper. Listen to this. Did you hear it? Comes another. Comes another. That's the Neolith talking telepathically to Gordon in the first game. Here, listen for it again. Comes another. The Neolinth, while communicating to you telepathically in Half-Life 1, is outright saying there is another out there. Comes another. But it keeps going. Another of his lines is... You are man. Be not man. For you he waits for you. You are man. He is not man. For you he waits for you. This is a clear allusion to the G-Man, but... Why is it significant? Because of the name of this creature's species, Neolinth. Everything we need to know is hidden right there in the name. Nile, Latin that literally means none or nothing, and Anth, from the Greek Anthropo, which means man. His name Neolinth, Nilanth, literally means not man. In one fell swoop, we are told outright that the G-Man is not man man. He's Niall Lance. Oh yeah. And here's the kicker. A detail so minute, but it locks this whole thing together. Look at this. Neolin, voiced by Michael Shapiro. G-Man, voiced by Michael Shapiro. The G-Man is actually voiced by the same actor as the Neolinth boss. Doesn't get much more clear-cut than that. By the way, I've been joking about it this whole episode, but the Neolinth looks like a human fetus. Is it too much to assume that one version of it, or a precursor species, could disguise itself as a saggy-faced human? Also, notice that the aliens from Zen tend to have this weird vestigial third arm right in the middle of their chests. The same place is where the G-Man is constantly playing with his tie. Tie or disguised arm. All right, quit it, Matt. You're starting to dip back into Sansa's nest territory. Should have just stopped back at the voice actor bit. Suffice it to say, Half-Life 3 may never actually be confirmed. It's a meme that I sadly suspect will never come true since Valve is too busy printing money with Steam and hat-based microtransactions. This one is literally valued at $12,000. Just saying. So with no big reveals or additional clues on the horizon, I figure this might be the closest we actually get to a final answer. And if you're a Half-Life community member and this theory got you upset, hey, remember that at at least I care about trying to solve this bit of lore as opposed to the people who made the game and will keep you hanging for eternity. Or not have an answer at all. I mean, take it from Mark Laidlaw, again, the lead writer I mentioned earlier, who has gone on record himself to say that, quote, I don't believe in canon. So keep that in mind. And with that, I think it's time. <sighs> Is it really that time again? It seems as if we only just arrived. Yep, G-Man, it's time. Time to remind everyone that it's all just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Rather than offer you the illusion of free choice, I will take the liberty of choosing for you.
subscribe. Listen to the G-Man. He would smash that subscribe button for you if it wasn't for his tiny, weird, vestigial baby arms. So do him a solid, punch that subscribe button in the next five seconds, and then comment below what other classic game franchise you want me to cover. Five, four, three... In the meantime, this is where I get off.